Hi, I'm your guest host, Ash, and this is the Data Standard Podcast Experience. We have a very exciting guest today. On our pod- podcast, we have Sajiva Dayaratne, VP of Engineering at Corotex. Today, we're speaking about data in the telematics industry. Welcome to the show. Nice to be here. Thanks for coming on to the show today. Go ahead and introduce yourself. So hi, everybody. So as uh, Ash mentioned, uh, my name is Sajiva. I'm the VP of Engineering at Cortex. Now, Cortex is a telematics company that's really turned into a supply chain assurance company. And what I mean by that is we use a lot of telematics data as well as IoT data from sensors on vehicles to provide uh, end-to-end data visibility for our customers so they can optimize their supply chain. So it's a very interesting space to be in. My, my career has been in kind of the data telematics industry for a while. We've been doing um, marine electronics and consumer electronics beforehand. So I've got a lot of experience in this field. I'm, I'm quite keen to uh, share kind of what I've learned over the time and, uh, and have a good conversation with you, Ash. So looking forward to it. Uh, you mentioned a little bit about uh, getting the data uh from a, in a high volume. So how do organizations and engineering teams handle this large volume of data in the telematics industry? And then also, once you get it, how are you analyzing this in real time and how are you doing that? Yeah, so it's, it's actually quite an interesting space to be in. I think a, a lot of telematics companies have now realized the importance of that data. Uh, and the data has shifted from being, you know, a position on a map for a vehicle from many, many years ago to be engine diagnostics, how the driver is behaving, what's going on in the surroundings, the weather conditions may be, the, the equipment that you are carrying, and additional information you can get from that equipment. So the data volume can become very, very high. Uh, for example, at Cortex, we, we ingest about a billion different data points uh, every month on our fleet. So it's quite, quite a large amount of data. The way most organizations approach this and the way kind of we've approached it is to try and classify them into, into three different data parts. And, and those data parts are tied in with the, the importance of the need for that data. So for example, uh, we have a hot data part and the hot data part would be your live telematics data that has an immediate need for the user of that data. So things like notifying uh, a user if their vehicle has had an accident, uh, notifying of a, a geofence entry or exit or some, some event that they need to take immediate action on or if a driver has fallen asleep uh, at the wheel or et cetera. So that comes to the hot data part and that's a real time data ingestion part. And usually all the analytics that happen on that uh, are using stream analytics technologies. So providing immediate, uh, immediate response. Then you go into kind of a more of a warm data part and the warm data part for us is things that need uh, not immediate but timely analytics on. So an example could be, you know, you have a, a plant that's operating during the day and you're trying to understand the efficiency of that plant on an hour by hour basis to, op- to optimize the operational activities. Or it could be uh, for a trip that the driver's taken, trying to give some analytics around how well they're driving, their fuel burn and, and things like that. So that's the warm data part. And that's a mixture of streaming data, but also going into storage in a, in a, uh, in a storage solution that has real time access or so something like a, a SQL database or, or data store like that. And then you go down to your cold data part, which is really where everything lands. So all the data from every sensor, every device that you collect, go into a, something like a data lake or, or a large data solution with really complicated analytics happening on there. So this is really where you spend a lot of your compute. You're trying to predict trends. You're trying to do all your machine learning. You're trying to do a deep analysis of all this data and kind of data fusion between the different data sources. So we, we've tried to approach that kind of split between those three different areas. And when it comes to the, the analytics part around how we use it, depending on those three data parts, there's different approaches, right? So for hot data, it has to be fast, has to be quick. So the amount of uh, analytics you can do is limited on usually trends, on short-term trends. Uh, on the warm data part, again, you have a little bit more time, a little bit more processing that can be done, but again, nothing, uh, nothing that can take multiple hours of processing or requires significant historical data. And the, the cold data part is really where your big analytics takes place, right? Where your data science team spends most of their time digging into all of these different data sources and fusion between them to bring out kind of the real insights you can get out of it. So it seems like your cold data part is where, uh, path is where uh, a majority of the uh, activities in data science, such as machine learning, et cetera, are happening. 
Would you be able to talk more about how you have implemented machine learning in these data paths to automate some things or classify cluster, et cetera? Yeah, so, so you're right that a lot of the traditional machine learning happens in that cold data path. I'll talk a little bit about kind of things we've done there, but I also want to touch on some things we are doing on that, on that hot data path because it's quite interesting. So on the cold path, a lot of the uh, machine learning models that we've been working on has been around prediction. So prediction of things that are important for our customers. So one of those examples is failures of devices or so failures of uh, vehicles or failures of uh, cooling units that they have. In our industry, it's, it's quite common for, um, for example, a refrigerated trailer that you're carrying goods on and it could be uh, food, it could be medical supplies, like for example, the COVID vaccine. Those cooling units have a tendency over time to fail. And if one of those fails while you're transporting a, a valuable cargo, then that entire cargo is, is lost, right? So a lot of the predictions around trying to utilize early warning signs that you can collect from the behavior of not just the cooling and, and, and defrosting, but also maybe the, in, the diagnostics you get from that, uh, that engine to be able to predict within a certain accuracy level, the chance of that failing over the next week or two. So it's a very short-term prediction, but it allows enough time for people to go and service those, uh, or proactively service those devices. So that's an area that we've actually spent a fair bit of time on because it has a material impact for how our customers can, can save money, but also on the safety of the product that they're carrying. Um, on, the, on the hot data part, actually, that's, that's an area that's quite exciting because a lot, of the, a lot of the work you see in the consumer space right now is being, is being attempting to provide kind of the user some real-time feedback on what's happening in their environment. And we are using that same technology for the drivers inside our vehicles. Um, safety is a big concern for us. So safety of the people uh, on the streets as well as our drivers, right? So we are using um, machine learning combined with some vision technologies. And again, this is uh, fairly new to be able to combine things like uh, what's been done in the industry today around detecting distractions for drivers, detecting uh, fatigue, uh, but also then combining that with all the telematics data we get from the vehicle to be able to identify is, is the brake being pressed? Is the driver fatigued Then they're not braking early enough on obstacles they see in front of them. So detect early, early warning signs of potential danger to the driver and to the people and warning them and coaching them real time. So we're trying to, we are trying to get the, the kind of machine learning models working on the edge for scenarios like that, but then also working in the back end for ingesting that large volume of cold data, as I mentioned before. So we're trying to approach both, both angles uh, in, in how we use machine learning. It's quite exciting space. Gotcha. Okay, so all of this real-time data that is coming in, obviously, it seems to me as if some of this data could be sensitive in nature. For example, like the COVID vaccine data, how it's getting spoiled, that's intellectual property and things related to that nature. So how, how do you go about addressing data privacy in this industry where things are just streaming from the ground in real time and you're doing analytics on it? Yeah, it's, it's actually quite a... Um complicated domain for, for more than one reason, right? So in, in traditional sense, categorizing kind of whose data it is, the ownership around that data becomes uh, a, little, a, bit, a little harder. So for example, um, you know, PII data, personally identifiable information, uh, it's very easy to classify who owns that, right? You, you have a driver's driving license there, the driver profile, that's, that's their data. Uh, then you start looking at telematics on a vehicle, uh, who owns that data becomes a question mark. Is that owned by the owner of the, of the fleet. Uh, but then the driver is using that and you can easily augment that behavior to find out the, the profile of the driver's driving habits. And could you use that for uh, performance management of the driver or could you use that for insurance claims? How does that affect their overall um, you know, standard within the industry? So, so there's a lot of issues around ownership. And I think that's a common problem that uh, the industry has in general to classify the ownership of the data set and who owns it. And that's, that's a challenge everywhere. But the approach kind of we take and my philosophy around this is to look at some of the key principles of data protection and see how they apply. So uh, the most important one is transparency to make sure that, that people are aware of what we are collecting and why. Uh, this is very important, especially for, for drivers who, who don't actually own the, the data ultimately, right? It's the company they work for that collects it, but giving them transparency on what we are collecting and why and having giving them some control to be able to opt out of that information. So a good example of that is um, having a driver facing camera 
that's not something that many drivers like to have, despite the potential benefits of the, the uh, interaction that they can have with the system via that, right? So we provide an option to have a hard, hard switch to turn that off, for example. Um, but that, that's, that's kind of the first part. And the second part is making sure as an organization, both us and uh, the organizations that work on our platform are abiding by the, the laws of the land. Uh, and that, that becomes quite important, not just from a GDPR perspective, but also from a, a data use perspective, right? Making sure that you know, what we are collecting, we are using it for the purpose that we told the user we are gonna use it for. Uh, despite all these interesting analytics that we can get out of the data, it's very important to always keep that hat, in, hat on on your head is that, yes, we can do this, but is this what we told the user we are gonna do with that data? And if we didn't, making sure we are transparent around, we are now, we are now finding now an interesting ways to utilize the data we collected from you. Are you okay with that? And, and, and do you want to opt out of that? Um, the, next, the next part comes to kind of the accountability security side of things. And that's, uh, again, a very, very important aspect of this especially when you operate a large SaaS platform like we do, which is multi-tenanted. So you have a lot of different organizations uh, with their data set residing on our, on our same cloud platform. It's very tempting for um, data scientists to be able to find trend lines across industry uh, in data that comes from a lot of different customers, right? Because you have a, have a large footprint and you can potentially make some really, really good insights into that data. But being very careful on what they're not what they're allowed to do and what they're not allowed to do in that mixing of data between, between customers. But also around kind of some of the data protection rules around data residency, uh, making sure your engineering teams don't have access to that data uh, in, the, in the same sense as well, right? And anything we, we do in terms of our internal analytics is all anonymized at the edge. And, and we don't have visibility on whose, whose data this is. We don't have visibility on which, which specific driver or customer generated this data for our internal analytics. So trying to kind of use those principles in, in not just the way we manage our data for our customers, but also in the way that data is accessed within the engineering teams to, to be able to enrich and, and do the R&D. So there's a lot of different angles there, but um, yeah, it's a challenging industry to be, um, to be working in because of that, right? Because of that complexity around the, the, the volume, the interaction with the data and also the data privacy reasons. Everything you mentioned so far is the current state of the industry and how the data is affecting the current state. So based on your experience in, uh, in the industry, how do you believe all this data coming in? How is that gonna change and how, it is, how is it gonna impact the future of the telematics industry? Yeah, you've, um, you've heard, I think you must have heard the term um, data is the new oil, right? I think um, people, people throw around that term quite a lot, but there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of substance to that term. In the past, what's been happening is as technology grows and as kind of new devices come to light, it becomes cheaper and easier to install and collect data. The volume of data that telematics companies like us ingest has become, uh, has grown exponentially really. Uh, and we have more and more kind of peripheral data sets that previously weren't really even considered to be core to telematics being ingested into that. Uh, Vision is a good example where we now have a lot of additional uh, data points that we wouldn't have had in the past around what's happening around the vehicle as well as inside the vehicle. And you see some companies in, in the commercial space like Tesla, for example, uh, used that recently to generate their own insurance product, right? So they have a, have, have a kind of very richness of what the driver's behavior is to be able to tailor things. So, we, so I see the same thing happening in, in telematics is all of this rich data that we're collecting now becomes, uh, becomes essentially a pool of noise. Right? It's, a, it's too much to be able to make meaning of. And what I see happening in the future is starting to use things like machine learning to be able to make it easier for organizations to actually navigate that data set. And we can see this happening everywhere. And whether it's actually starting from being able to ask intelligent queries of your data, uh, you don't know what you don't know and you don't really know how to manipulate that data in a reasonable way. And it's very hard for data scientists to predict what people might want. So being able to take natural language processing and provide ways for customers to ingest that data in a, in a human-friendly way and make meaning of it in a human-friendly way is, is gonna become one key thing. The, the other area that um, I see a lot of potential for going forward is taking away the mundane tasks that organizations have to do with their data from a compliance and regulatory point of view 
and and taking that off taking that workload off their plate so they can focus on what's important for their organization and in most companies today you have uh, things like um, in in telematics anyway you have uh, regulatory compliance around how drivers operate their vehicles you you have tax obligations your road tax and all of that taking that all away having having that all automated and generated using some intelligence with the data you have so customers can focus more on the the experience for their drivers improving their efficiencies and actually reducing their carbon footprint so so that that's an area i see us really uh, as an industry going and and the other the other part that's kind of worth talking about in this space is really the the edge um the, the what was happening on the edge right in the past telematics has largely been around data coming into a back end solution where a lot of that intelligence is there for the fleet operators but we're starting to see a big uh, big focus towards what's happening on the edge for the drivers right and that's i talked a bit about that before around you know driver coaching and driver safety but also using that to be able to uh, help the driver optimize their work day and also to keep um, keep their day to day from being uh, more convenient and you see you see the the large trucking companies we've seen the the tesla truck trying to use that data to actually uh, automate some of the procedures the drivers do i think that's still a few years away before before that becomes norm but that's the kind of area where i see a lot of the industry trying to focus now as well is to get that get the wealth of that information and help the person who's actually delivering the goods who's driving that vehicle uh, there's a lot of challenges there and i think that's that's an area where um, where the industry can go as well thank you it is great to hear about the present and the future of such an exciting industry thank you very much for being on our show today and we really appreciate your time so um where can our community find you online yeah i'm i'm quite um, i'm quite quiet online i'm i'm available on linkedin you can find my profile on linkedin uh, i do have a twitter handle uh, it's sajiva_d i don't um, i don't post much on twitter i usually use that to follow the industry but yeah linkedin is the best place to find me and um, i'm very keen to connect with with people in uh, not just telematics but really in the in the technology industry i think there's a lot going on at the moment around the world and uh, keen to participate in that community more all right once again thank you very much for coming on to our show and uh, have a good day thanks ash see you later